And we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your story barista, uh, Hank Garner. <laughs> it's a bad joke, but um, but I, I can't help it. Um, and today I am super excited to be joined by Hank Philippi Ryan, one of my favorite authors and uh, someone that I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. And we've gotten to hang out uh just about every year for the last uh, two or three years. And it's been so much fun. Um, Hank is one of those writers that I enjoy every book that comes out and I love her story and the stories that she writes. And we're here uh, to talk about the writing challenge that we're in the middle of and the NaNoWriMo uh, yearly challenge that, that comes up around this time. Uh, Hank has, is this your 15th book? Hank, I'm working on I'm working working on my fifteenth book, so and, I, and I am right in the middle of it. <laughs> well, well, when we are talking live, this is uh, the middle of NaNoWriMo. It's literally the fourteenth. We're we're right smack in the middle, and this is where you know one thing uh, in in our sixty day writing, writing challenge, Hank. We took a whole month to plan out and to to slow down and think about our story before getting into the writing and a lot of people um when the first month of writing came along when november uh you know approached there was so many people just kind of uh the, the words just rushed out because we'd been thinking about it for so long well that kind of wears off after week one and here we are now in the middle we we're finishing week two and it's starting to get, to get difficult. Uh, as someone who is now working on her 15th book, how do you maintain that momentum throughout uh, the process of writing? It's such a great question. And I think the idea, the luxury, I mean, the true luxury of taking a month to think about the book before you write it is such a brilliant, brilliant thing. So often we forget um, how much can be done in our brains? I know Dennis Lehane used to talk about that he thought about his books so much that when he got home, he was surprised that more of the manuscript wasn't written because he just <laughs> felt that he, you know, he, he right. must have worked on it so much. And I have to say, too, that the and then I'll get to the practical part. But the thinking about it is so interesting because you know that our brains work on things, our subconscious subconscious right. works on things subconscious too maybe works on <laughs> things when we don't even know it and i've been a television reporter for 43 years and i i have you know confronted corrupt politicians and chased down criminals and talked to murderers and done big pivotal interviews and the way i get ready for those big interviews is i do them in my head right when i'm in that alpha state before i go to sleep I pretend that I'm actually having that conversation and things emerge in my imagination. I think of things that I wouldn't have thought of if I had just panic, been panicking and researching and typing out questions. Because if we allow our brains to, uh, to open, then the story will appear. So, and I promise you it will. I mean, sometimes, some days I think, okay, I trust that the story will appear, but any time now is good. You know, I, I don't mean right. to you, universe, but any time now is good. Mm -hmm. So there is not in, in all of my 15 books. And I can say that in every author I've ever talked to, no matter how famous and no matter how successful, that middle of the book is a mess. I do a whole class on it called the muddle in the middle because it is quicksand. <laughs> it is horrible. You're, you know, you're at word number 42,000 or whatever. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I have 40,000 more words to go. What the heck is going to even if you know what's going to happen, it just seems like people are just yammer, 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 yammer talking or nothing is happening or too much is happening or you can't think of anything. Um, and I and I, and I have some, I mean, you've got your first act done, right? You've got your first right. act done. You've got your world and your characters and the story question and the in, inciting incident and complications. And then you're going to turn to act two. And that's when the story twists and turns and the, and the complications uh, get more complicated and bad things happen and worse things happen and twist, twist, twist and all those things. And the when you look at it as a whole book, it is incredibly intimidating. 
and you think I'm only halfway through, what am I going to do? And this is a mindset and the mindset of the muddle in the middle can be so destructive. And the way that I handle it is I have some tricks and we can list them, but I'll just give you one right now. One yep. is, one is, and this is awful. It's like being a five-year-old, <laughs> but I have a chart of how many words a day I write. And see, it's very high tech, isn't it? Yeah, and, I love it. <laughs> and the goal at the end where I give myself a little smile or not, right? And if you think of the middle of the book as arithmetic, if it's addition, it's just addition and addition and addition. If you write your thousand words a day or 1500 words a day or 1200 words a day, words a day, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. So you're just having one little slice of the book. You're not writing a whole book. You're just doing the next step, you're just doing the next step. And it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be there. So there's not a day that goes by that I don't think I'm typing, I'm typing and I'm thinking, this is the worst thing that anybody has ever written. This is possibly the worst sentence that anyone has ever written. And then I think, yep, that it's true. It's pretty bad, but just go ahead and write another bad sentence and another bad sentence. Right. And when you do that, at some point, very soon, you'll write a really good sentence. And then you'll think, oh, those bad sentences weren't so bad. They, they, were, they were really getting me somewhere. But you won't know that until you keep going. You won't know that until you keep going. So part of it is just laughing at yourself and persevering. You know Ben Mesrick, the writer Ben Mesrick, you must know him, yeah. wrote uh, The Accidental Billionaire and the, the book that became the movie 21. And I asked him once, what do you do when you get to the middle? I mean, do you just think, ah, oh, I don't know how to write. I forget how to write. I don't know how I wrote those other books. I can't write this book. I don't know. And he said, no. He said, I sit down at the computer in that horrible middle and I look at, I look at my page, my blank page, and I think to myself, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be awesome. And it was such a groundbreaking moment for me because I sit at my computer and think, oh, I don't know, <laughs> you know, this, I don't even know how to do this. And I don't do that anymore. I sit down at my computer now and I say, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I know it sounds so crazy, but once you put your brain in that place, it really, it really makes a difference. Have you ever done that? Have you changed your whole mindset for things? Yes. And there, there's something to be said for um, trusting that, that the story will be there and, and just showing up just to see what, what your subconscious is going to come up with that day. And, um, you know, we talk a, a lot about that no matter how many books that you've written, when you start a new one, that blank page is the great equalizer, you know, that, that everyone stares at the same blank page, no, no matter what you've accomplished in the past. Yeah. But, but the other way to look at that is you could look at that as in an intimidating way that, that you, it, it's blank and there's nothing on it. Or you could say, look at the possibility. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's the way I've, kind of come to think about it. look at the possibility what I mean, I could had, this had, page be i had an intern at, at, at my television station i had an intern once who was getting ready to graduate from college she was brilliant and she was so smart and she was so funny and she was so talented and she just had everything going for her and she was terrified of the world terrified of the world mm. and um i said to her her name was something like angelique of all things i mean she, this beautiful woman and i said Angelique, why are you terrified? You are so smart and so talented and so confident and so wonderful. You know, the whole world is open to you. The whole world is open to you. And she says, I know. And that's what scares me. So, <laughs> so much for the advice from, from, good old, from good old Hank. But I think that um, I think that one of the things, the practical way to get through the middle. I mean, sometimes we just need somebody to say, here's what you do, you know, step by step. And I can give you like my five step, really infallible way of getting through the middle, if you want to hear it. Absolutely. Okay. We, so, we, are, we are your students today. 
Oh boy. Oh boy. And I'm, and I, and I promise you, you all, this will work. I promise you this will work quickly. The point of a whole book is that something happens because someone wants something and they're going after it. Somebody right. wants something, they're going after it and things happen along the way for them to get it. Okay. So in each segment of your book, each either scene or chapter of your book is divided into really five parts. What it, one is, what does the person want? Ask yourself, what does the person want? What does my main character want? And then say to yourself, why do they want that? Why do they want that? What's their motivation? They want this because because of something, because you don't take action. And when you want something, it has to be because of something. Right. So there's the desire for the thing. Then there's the motivation. So we understand why would you do that? Well, they're doing that because of this. Then there's the element of discussion, the, the discussion, the decision making process that the character goes through, protagonist or antagonist, everybody in the book, a decision-making process that the character goes through about deciding what to do to get that thing. What thing are, what are they going to do next? Mm -hmm. And in that decision-making process, that's when you unearth the philosophy, the motivation, the, how the character views the world, their decision-making process. Are they going to do the selfish, uh, nasty, ugly, destructive thing? or the benevolent, charitable, honest, honorable thing, and how they think about what they're going to do. How do they decide? That's also where you can put in setting, right? You would do something different in a snowstorm than you would in the tropics. You would sure. do something different in your own bedroom than you would in someone else's or someone else's house rather than yours with a stranger or with a friend. You're deciding you know, you're deciding what your action is going to be. And that is very emotionally um, revealing. And then number four is you actually do the thing. And then now you're in action already. You've got a person who wants something. We understand why. We know how they got to their decision about what to do. Now they do the thing. Action, action, action. Oh my gosh. They shoot someone. They enter the room. They open the letter. They burn the letter. They close the door. They open the door. They get in the car, whatever it is. They do the thing. Now you have action. Now you and look what's happening. Your book is your book is going forward, right? Your book is going forward here. Someone wants something. Why do they want it? They decide what to do. They do it. And then wham, something stops them. There's an obstacle. There's a, something in the way. What's that? Something happens. Something happens to impede their progress forward, right? So now they have to deal with that. And as a result of that, now they want something else. Now they need to do something else. They need to do, they need to want something else because the motivation again, now we're all back on step one. What do they want? The motivation is because this obstacle happened. Now they have to do something else. Oh, oh, I'm going to think about what to do. Decide, 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 take another action. Will that work? Yes, no obstacle. And if you keep going through those five steps, Look what, look what happens. Your character wants something. You, we, the reader, understand why. We decide along with them, ooh, is that a good decision or is that a bad decision? Eh, I don't know. I don't know. Let's see what happens. And then it happens. And then something happens and they have to change. And you see how that can be, that can be a chapter. That can be a scene. You can end, you know, you can end at the decision. You can end a chapter at the decision. You can end a chapter at the obstacle. You can end a chapter at the outcome. You can you can play with where you divide those five elements as you're going through as you're going through each time. But you see how again that's cutting your book into segments. And in the middle, where something has to happen at every moment, and it has to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse for the character, when you have this handleable five segment process. It isn't like this endless book, this endless middle that's yawning out in front of you. It's just what really happens next and why and do it. And then there's action. You see, you see what I mean? Right. So with this, and, and that's a, a fantastic uh, way to think about story structure. Um, do you use that structure in the beginning of a book? Do you like, uh, I know you said you break the story down into segments and apply this to it. And, and, and I get that, but does that work on a, on a macro level as well? 
like is is there like a uh the story falls under this grand scheme and then breaks into these smaller sections of of kind of recurring uh want uh and action you know sequences back and forth does does i guess what i'm asking does it apply on a macro level and micro level as the book progresses on i don't know i think <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm listening to you like yeah i wonder if it does that's a really good idea i don't know um i don't know i mean i think a book is all about something so all a book is all about someone wanting something right I wish this, I want this. If I don't get this, you know, if I fail, this will happen. And I think that's another thing, another thing quickly, so I don't want to forget to ask yourself, what will happen if the character fails in that middle motivation section? They're going to be thinking, what will happen if I fail? And that's, you know, that reiterates the stakes throughout, which is really important in writing any kind of a novel. And I'm talking, this works for any kind, any genre. Um, what will happen if they don't get the thing is is constant to keep up. But I, I, I wouldn't write a book unless something happened to the character because that's what it's about, right? It's about mm -hmm. this some major thing that happens to a character or for a character or with a character or because of a character, something happens. And then their life, you know, in the in this chunk of book that turns out to be the story um, it's, it's what happens to the person. So they go in to the book as one person, sort of come out changed as, as someone else. And that's why we're with them on this journey. Does the book go into, I kind of don't think it does, okay. actually. But I do think that from the beginning, the five segment plan will work because that's the engine that keeps the book going is desire and obstacle and regrouping, you know, the, and stakes. So they're always after something. But my goal in the middle, at least, is not to have it be just a bunch of people sitting around talking forever or, right. you know, sort of serially going here, then going here, then going here, and then, and then, and then, and then. And it becomes kind of episodic, which, which you don't want either. And so the way to keep it from being repetitively episodic is that that obstacle is that twist, that change, that impediment is something new every time. And it can be big or small. You know, it can be the obstacle is you could lose your reading glasses so you can't read the contract. Or there could be a sudden blizzard or there could be the guy with his finger on the nuclear button. It can be any level. It can be any level of obstacles. You know, you fall down and break your ankle. Your dog is lost. You're hungry. All those things are obstacles. It's not 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 always and not and probably rarely you know the guy walks in with a gun i mean that's just and he you know he only meant elmore leonard with a guy walks in with a gun when it comes to the middle he just means he just meant something happens it just right um i'm glad you brought up twists uh just a minute ago because your books are kind of known for your really sly twists um uh -huh. especially your new book yes. the house guest um you know, they're uh, you know, for the last decade or so, um, we we have seen a lot of books that employ the uh, unreliable narrator and some kind of monumental twist in in that way. And, um, and and you really have to be careful with that now because it's been it's been done very well, but then done uh, a lot. So how do you. Um, maintain the surprise for the reader um, while employing something that, that we're all becoming familiar with? Like how do you subvert the reader expectation while, while bringing in these great twists that, you know, give the reader whiplash in, in some points? Oh, thank you. First of all, I want to show you this. This is like, I'm re reaching out of the screen here. This is one of the very first times that this you're getting breaking news here, Hank. Um, here's what the cover looks like, you all. The the advanced reader copies. I mean, I know some people are watching this on on tape, but um, the, the advanced it. reader copies just arrived. And isn't she isn't she great? I mean, isn't that? And you see how in her glasses that you see she's seeing that resort, which is they did a great job. Thank you for yes, it. Fantastic. Um, 
So I, I know that the Hank Garner NaNoWriMo planners are just going to wince at this, but I have no idea. And don't listen, Hank. Um, I have no idea when I go into my novels, what's going to happen. I don't know. And I don't know who wants what really, except for the main character on page one. I don't know who wants what, and I don't know really why they're there. So in the house guest, which is third person, but from a close third person point of view right. um, of Alyssa Westland McAllen, we know what she knows. We know what she knows. And she is really going to tell us everything that she knows. She is not an unreliable narrator. She, she tells us the truth. Um, but, but the truth is only what she knows. Right. You know, so she doesn't know everything. I mean, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. We just know what we hear and see and what someone tells us, what someone tells us and what we believe and what we decide to believe. OK, so that's how you can keep um, that's how you can keep a twist or a change fair, because we all make mistakes and we all have, you know, we all perceive things differently. And because of our emotional backgrounds and because of our upbringing, because of how our personalities work, we're either super wary about things that you might not need to be worried about or, you know, super accepting of something that you, that the reader is thinking, I don't know, is he really good? I don't know. You should think about this. So one of the ways is to play with point of view. So if I'm only in Alyssa's head and I'm only taking in things, I can be, I can have, a, I can have my other characters have motivations that they don't reveal because, because they're only revealing it to themselves and we're not in their head. So it's, I mean, this book, first, per, I mean, sorry, third person, close point of view is as much like life as real life can be, as if you were the main character of this novel. People are coming into your life and they're telling you things, showing you things, offering things, saying things, guiding you along the way or not. And you get to decide who's telling you the truth, right? So right. it's not, it's not so tricky um, in a, in a third person point of view, uh, with one main character, one main character's point of view, because we're only just taking it in. Now you're so incredibly right that my readers are smart. They are incredibly smart and they are, you know, half of their brain is focused on trying to figure out what happens in this book. And right. I, and I know that I am hyper aware of that when I'm writing my novels, that I'm, that my readers are thinking, is he good? Is he bad? Is she good? Is he bad? You know, it's called the house guest for gosh sake. And at some right. point somebody comes to stay with the main character. Is that the house guest? Or maybe there's another reason for house guest. I, you know, I wouldn't put that in the, as the title if I weren't saying like <laughs> red flag, red flag, but, right. but maybe that's not the house guest. I mean, so that's how I also deal with this is that, I, I, the author, am telling you something. And as the main character is believing something, and this is very insidery, so you, I, I hope you know what I'm seeing here, saying here. As the, as the author, I'm creating a reality for you by giving you what the main character thinks. But what if she's wrong? What if she's wrong? And, and that's how you do, that's how I do at least, that's how I do my twists, is that she's just a regular person and she, right. could, be wrong, and she could be wrong. And she also may not have decided um, consciously what to do. And I don't have to tell you everything that she's thinking about, but honestly, actually in the house guest I do, I pretty much tell you everything that she's thinking about. So she is not... My main character is not hiding anything from the reader. And I think that's fair. I think that's fair. But then there's also me as the author who's creating situations that could be ambiguous. And if Alyssa decides that it means something, I'm hoping to shepherd you to that belief as well. And then even the people who think, oh, no, no, I know she's trying to get me to think that, but that's, I'm not going to buy it. I'm hoping that you're wrong too. So 
that that's the sort of uh, you know three dimensional chess that I'm yeah. playing with main character, author, and reader. Speaking of um, character point of view, um, the the third person close, uh, you're right is is very. Um, it's it gives you almost the benefit of first person, like being inside the character said, with just a little just a little bit removed. Yes. Um, and I'm thinking back through your books. Um, have you ever written in the first person? I have, you know, it's interesting. My first, my first novels, the Charlotte McNally novels, right, which right. were um, mysteries more than thrillers, uh, starring uh, a television reporter in Boston who's worried she's getting too old for TV. <laughs> I really <laughs> scraped the bottom for that idea. Um, they are in first person present tense. And I love them. I deeply love them. And someone asked me at one point, why did you decide to write in first person present tense for those four books? And I had to confess that I never thought about it. I didn't decide. I didn't decide. I was such a newbie when I was writing that first novel that I thought, I have a great idea for a book, Secret Messages in, in Computer Spam. That's what it was about, Secret Messages in Computer Spam. And I thought, what a great idea for a mystery. I'm just going to write a book. And I just sat down and started writing it. And that's what came out. It was very natural to me to write first person, present tense. Um, as I, So I didn't decide. My brain decided that that's what felt right. As I got more uh, experience, and I changed to writing the Jane Ryland thrillers, uh, starting with The Other Woman, which won the Mary Higgins Clark Award. I knew, I, I, I knew that I needed to write a bigger sounding book, whether that was real, whether my decision was real or just wrong. I don't know, but I decided that grownups wrote their in third person. That, that, that went through my head. And it was very difficult for me to get my brain out of first person. And I honestly, I know this is so crazy, but I would sit down at this very computer and think, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess and she went into the forest. And I thought, okay, that's third person, past tense. I know how to, I know how to tell a fairy tale. So that's right. how I'll write my book. But I actually had to get that construct in my head from fairy tales before I could write in third person. It's still very hard. I could write a book very, I mean, never easily, but I could write a book pretty easily in first person present tense. I just won't, I just don't think I will. Yeah. Is, is there a benefit or a hindrance to writing third person versus first person? It, one of the first things you think about when writing first person is that whatever information you convey to the reader has to come through your protagonist eyes. They like, she doesn't know anything that's going on in the world except for what she sees and hears. That's, that's it. I um, love that. I don't, I don't, I mean, I know it's a challenge. I understand the challenge, but I love that. I mean, I have been a reporter for 43 years Right. And that I go out in search of a story, you know, at, at, when I'm doing my investigations, um, journalism, I'm, I'm, I'm going out in search of a story. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm, who I'm going to meet. I'm going to follow clues and track down leads and look at documents and do interviews and do research and go places. And I find things out and the story develops from what I discover. So that first person journey of someone trying to find out something, that's how I am. That, that's my life. So I'm used to looking for the answers in, you know, many and myriad places. That's comfortable to me. Um, and it's a fun challenge. And I, and I, and I love it. The, the idea that in third person, you can switch and be somebody else someplace else. Sure. That's great. I mean, that's, that's just great. And I think the, the downfall of third person, multiple points of view is that you might, it might, it can get pretty complicated because you think, Oh, I'll just go to Washington. Oh, I'll just go to Paris. Oh, I'll just put somebody in Istanbul. Oh, what if I'll put somebody on the moon? That'll be cool. And you, and you begin to solve problems by making it this sort of Rube Goldberg machine. Um, and so I think you have to be really careful that a book can be complex, but you don't want it to be complicated. Um, and those are really two different things. Right. Right. Um, let's talk um, 
work-life balance for just a minute because uh-huh. uh, you, you, have are, <laughs> you are that that rare creature that is a uh, a successful uh, selling author and you still maintain your day job. You are um, a, 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 an award-winning, greatly successful um, journalist. Um, it, you would think that one uh, would would suffer at, at the hands of the other at some point, and you seem to to main those two maintain those two worlds pretty well. Do do you feel like your um, and as a journalist? Uh, you kind of have the benefit of, of witnessing human nature um, for a living that, that obviously is a benefit to, to the kind of writer that you are getting to absorb, you know, all of the, the stories that you do. Um, what do you think about that? Like maintaining those two aspects of your life and have you ever been tempted to put one aside in favor of the other? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I started writing, I didn't start writing fiction until I was 55, you know, and that was 15, more than 15 years ago, um, which is really pretty interesting. And at the time, um, and for years and years, I was absolutely a full-time 24-7 investigative reporter as well. And uh, I remember once saying to my mom, you know, being during writing primetime, my first novel, um, I remember saying to my mom, I, ah, you know, I love this book and I think people are going to love it, but um, I'm just really not quite sure I can do this. I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure I can juggle all of this. And my mom paused and then she says, well, dear, you will, if you want to. And I just thought, okay, you know, there you have it. Thanks mom. Thanks mom. (laughs) Right. I think that goes for all of us. Yeah. Um, We think about, you know, when we really want something like the characters in our books, when we really want something, we figure out a way, we figure out a way to do it. Now, my husband and I have been married for 25 years. He has kids. They're grown. They're marvelous. They're great. They live out of town. I have grandchildren. They they live out of town. We don't have any pets. We don't really have any plants that live. You know, we have a garden outside. So a lot of people have a lot of... um, responsibilities that yeah. I don't have. So, you know, if dinner is at 10 o'clock, that's really okay. My husband, you know, we eat a lot of carry out salmon. There's a, you know, there's a lot of juggling like that, yeah. um, that goes on. My husband is a really uh, top notch and hardworking criminal defense attorney. So he's just as passionate about what he does as I am at what I do sure. and very supportive um, and lovely complimentary jobs. It's always good to have in-house counsel. Um, but in answer to your yeah. question, I know you're thinking, finally, um, <laughs> I am evolving out of television after 43 years. Um, I, I, I think I'm ready to declare victory in television and say, I, you know, I have 37 Emmys. Do I need 38 Emmys? Maybe, you know, maybe, but, maybe, but I but won't say not. you don't, <laughs> I, I, but maybe not. And I, and I also think frankly and terrifyingly um, if I don't, I mean, I, I love this work as, as a writer. I, I love my job as a bestselling author. Um, I could not, you know, if I don't do this now, when am I going to do that? Right. But from the standpoint of people, I mean, I had an absolute full-time constant, high pressure, high stakes, cannot make a mistake day job uh, every day until really the pandemic. And I, and at the pandemic um, we were, we all stayed home and I worked uh, on investigative stories via zoom as well as I could. But at, at some point I sort of, if the, I mean, the pandemic is, is horrible and life ruining, but for a lot of people, but to me at some point it allowed me to think I, you know, what is really important to me right now yeah. Um, where can I get better? Where can I grow? But again, for people who are working two jobs, the key would be, you know, the, the writing job and a day job. The key is to be very, very organized and to not be worrying about your book when you're at your work and not be worrying about your work when you're doing your book. You are present. You are focused. You are doing the thing that you that you mean to do. You're not doing the laundry. You're not doing you're not answering emails. You're just 
in this amount of time that you can carve out. And you should, you can say to yourself, I'm going to work from 8.30 p.m. till 9.30 p.m. and nobody's going to come in here and nobody's going to bother me. And that's all I'm, I'm going to make an appointment with myself to do this. And so and you don't want to, the thing that I think is destructive is when you think, I'll do it in a little while, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it on the weekend, I'll catch up on the weekend, I'll write really, really a lot on the weekend. And then you wake up Saturday morning and you think, I can't, I'm not going to write 4,000 words, you know, I, this is Saturday. <laughs> so one step at a time, one thing at a time. As I keep saying, you know, it's addition, just add, just, I say to my husband every night before we go upstairs, I say, I'm just going to say good night to the book. And I open my manuscript before I go upstairs for the night and just kind of look at it for five minutes after having written during the day, just so that's the last thing I see, you know, so that it's like, I, I, you know, coaches always tell their players, handle the ball. You know, they tell yeah. football players, just hang on to that football and walk around with it. Um, I, 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 you need to keep that sort of cosmic writerly connection with your book. And as mom said, you will if you want to, but yeah, you can take it. some control of the focus and the time that you spend writing it. No one is going to call you and say, hey, how, you know, how are you doing on that book? You got your pages? They're not going to do that. Only you can do that. Only you can do that. So you're in charge of yourself as a writer. And the people who decide to take charge and write their book and not just think about it, not just talk about it, not just whine about it, um, they're the ones who are going to accomplish what they've always wanted. I love that idea of saying goodnight to the book and letting that be one of the last things that you really ruminate on before going off to sleep. Um, I, I've always tried to teach my kids that um, when you have a problem that you just can't find a solution to, tell yourself that that you're going to allow your brain to work on that while you're asleep and trust that when you wake up there will be an answer to it and that has happened so many times in my life and and especially when we're talking about a pursuit like writing where we are depending on that connection to our subconscious pave the way for your subconscious to do something about it and trust that 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 you know the answer to the problem and it'll come to you when I, I love that idea. That's a that is a great actionable. You know, and it's, it is. And it's not and, you know, it's not magic. You all I mean, right. it's not like, oh, all I have to do is think about it tonight and tomorrow I'll have the answer. It doesn't it's not, doesn't happen overnight all the time. Right. It's, it's just in there. It's interesting. Thomas Edison had a great quote, supposedly, that he supposedly said, um, when you think, oh, my golly. When you think something, when you think, when you think a problem is impossible, just remember it isn't, you know, it's just that you haven't thought of the answer yet. Right. It's just that you haven't thought of it. It's not that there's no answer to it. It's just that you haven't thought of it yet and think, and I got the quote terribly wrong, but it's something <laughs> like that. Um, and think of all the times how that our brains are so unbelievably inexplicably magical that you think and you think and you think and you think, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then at some point, you know, and you think, where right. did that answer come from? Where did that come from? A, you know, a fraction of a second ago, I didn't know it. A fraction of a second ago, I didn't know it. And now I do. Let me tell you one more quick thing that I have yeah. learned that is amazingly helpful to me. Is And it may be because of being a reporter for so long, but, but there's a function in my word um, software where you can dictate, you know, dictate. Mm -hmm. And I have started just dictating the books and dialogue comes out so quickly. Um, you know, it's like when you tell somebody a story out loud and the story just kind of starts flowing and you think, I don't know where that came from, but okay. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm dictating my novels, the conversation comes out, the setting comes out, the people say things that I hadn't planned for them to say. And I just keep going. I don't put... Um, I don't put all the quotation marks in because it takes too long to say open, yeah. close, close, quote, close, quote, or whatever you say. I put comma, I put yeah. comma and I put period and I put new line, which sometimes types out new line, which is not helpful, but does add to your word count. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I have to go back and fix it. And when I go back and fix it, 
um, then I can edit the, the punctuation. Sure. But if that works for you all, I highly recommend that. It, it's amazing. Excellent. Um, I I have a copy of the new book uh, from NetGalley that I've been reading on my Kindle and um, love it. Glad to know that the bound galleys are are out now. But but tell us about the the house guest. Um, it comes out after the first of the year. What what was the the first thing that came to you about this book? What was the the puzzle that fascinated you about this book? Well, I have a friend, and she used to have a boyfriend. This is a long time ago. And they finally got married. And every day she would go off to work in the morning and he would go off to work in the morning. And he was a real estate salesperson. And she would come home at night and she would say, honey, how do you do? And he'd say, oh, you know, I'm getting there. I've got some big deals in the works. You know, look at this house, look at this house, all this. this. And they would have these big discussions about um, his work and her work. So turns out, after about a year, she found out that he wasn't going to work at all. He just was making it up. He was a really a real estate person, but he didn't have a job and he wasn't going to an office and he wasn't selling real estate and he wasn't doing any of it. It was just not true. And she, they were married. They were oh married. Goodness. And she had no idea that this was just a complete fraud. This is a dear friend. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, gosh, I didn't know either. You know, how, how do I know that what's his name isn't out selling houses? He's I'm clearly not very good because he never comes home having sold a house. And she would like make postcards for him and make ads for him and give him pep talks like it's going to happen tomorrow. And he'd be like, yeah, I know, I know it will. Not true, not true, not wow. any of them. And I thought, oh my golly, here's someone she lives with. You know, how does she not know about this guy who's clearly a con artist? Right. Um, who, who she was married to. And she's smart. This isn't a dumb woman. This is a really smart, savvy, professional woman. So then I took that away. So then in the pandemic, my husband, who, I, as I said, is a criminal defense attorney, he stayed home from his law office. I stayed home from Channel 7. And I have my study here. And he's been working in the family room, you know, on a desk with his computer and with his files and with his everything in the other room. I can't see him and I can't hear him. You know, he's pat beyond the bookshelves here yeah. and another room between us. And then he's I can't hear what he I can't hear when he's on the phone. I can't hear anything about him. And, you know, we have lunch together every day and it's very cute and dinner together. And I say, what happened during the day? What what did you do when he tells me things and I tell him things? And I started thinking, you know, I don't really know what he's doing. I, I don't, he could really be doing anything and he could be telling me anything. And then I, and you know, he could be out there doing, you know, make, make up something terrible. I don't know. And if someone would say, didn't you know he was X, Y, and Z? How could you not know he's your husband? He's in the next room. How did you, how would you not know? And I would honestly not know. I, I would honestly not know. So yeah. then I started thinking about like June Madoff and Bernie Madoff and people said, How, you know, come on, Mrs. Madoff, of course you knew about what your husband was doing. And I was one of those people that would say, come on, she had to know. But, you know, maybe she didn't. So the, all those things together roll into, and as you can see, you can see what, you know, now that you've read part of it, you can see the genesis of this. How well do you know the person you love? How well do you know the person who sleeps on the other side of the bed? We, you really only know what you hear and what they tell you and what you want to believe. And in the house guest, Alyssa Westland McCallan has been happily married, she thinks, happily married to her smart, powerful, faithful, brilliant husband, rich, rich, rich husband. And one day he just up and leaves. He just says, I'm out of here. Goodbye. He takes his computer. He takes his suitcase, you know, and he says, I, I'm, I'm out of here. Goodbye. And she says, why, why, why? And he won't tell her. And then she begins to realize um, that he has taken all the friends. She has no more friends. He has, he has threatened to take all the money that they have. He has threatened to take her house. And for some reason, he's making her life miserable. And she really needs an ally. She has no friends and no one to turn to. And in the house guest on about page one, she gets a new friend who has troubles of her own. 
and in a tw in a story that Lisa Unger called Hitchcockian, um, <laughs> they decide to solve each other's problems. However, it is not what you think it is, and it is my version of Gaslight meets Thelma and Louise, and that is the house guest. So again, you know, I I, I it's one of those things where you think you know what you're reading, and then you're not. So I crossing fingers. Um, it has a blurb on the cover from Lisa Scottolini and blurbs inside from Lisa Gardner and Lisa Unger and Wanda Morris and Julie McMillan and Heather Gudenkopf and all kinds of people who um, really love it. So I'm crossing fingers that as it's beginning to make its way out in the world, Gaslight meets Thelma and Louise um, is the house guest. And deserving 100% of each one of those lines of praise. I love it. I know everyone else is going to love it too. Um, Hank, thank you so much for dropping in today and sharing some writerly wisdom with us. Hank, you you are a flat out genius. You are your your voice, your thought process, your philosophy, your generosity, your helpfulness to reading and writing world, and you are unparalleledly wonderful and i and i love being with you and i Stop love being it. on your show no and i and you all know this right you all know this there is no one like you um and i am honored as pi to be here anytime thank you so much thank you so much